So, so I will give you uh, this perspective. Now I'm wearing back my hat as an academic from the University of Warwick, where we have uh, several projects running around the field of medical devices with a specific on low income setting. We normally talk about low income setting because uh, there are very, uh, you know, poor facilities also in high income country and the other way around. There are brilliant hospitals in very low income uh, countries. So we should every time try to talk about uh, low income settings rather than that. What I will do, I will give you an overview, but then I invite you to have a look to the presentations which uh, other colleagues from my lab will give. Bosul, unfortunately, she's speaking now. Davide will talk later. Uh, Roy, you have seen part of her work before. There is a lot going on, uh, Alessia. So, the thing I want to say with this slide is that we are a multidisciplinary bench of people. So, we have together Roy, she's a medical physicist. Alessia, she's a philosopher with a background in, in ethics. She's sitting somewhere behind. Uh, Tim is a mathematician. Uh, Carlo is an health economist. So, in my group, this discussion is already going on because that's the way forward. This is the future. So, if we don't manage to open our mind and put together several uh, competent for the same reason, basically we are just lagging behind, we are dinosaurs, because the future is there and they are already talking the same language. Do you think they distinguish among themselves if they are medical physicists or whatever? Those are our labels, you know. It's just that they struggle to find, as James was saying, putting something square in a circle is, is our fault, it's their fault. Now, oh yeah, they like to call themselves the minion, but because they want to say that I'm fatty and bully, just for that. Now, what we are doing in particular is trying to understand if we can make medical devices more and more resilient to income settings. And I will give you just two exemplars and, uh, and an overview. Where are we coming from? Well, when we work in high income country, we have been applying artificial intelligence in my group since ever for mental stress detection, false prevention in hypertensive patients, and uh, most recently, congestive heart failure with work that Michele, unfortunately, she's also presenting right now. Just to give you an idea, we were around, okay, this is a rock cure. If you are in this corner, it means you have no false positive, no false negative. And over time, this is Paolo Melillo, my first PhD student. We were performing like that, which was good for the time because, you know, it was uh, published. And now we are about here because Rosanna, she completely retalked the way you're doing signal processing if you want to put intelligence into a mobile phone. So she has gone through the way we were doing signal processing for labs, for clinical settings, and she has worked out how should we analyze the same signal if we want to put it in a small device that you probably are wearing. And this is the gaining we are getting. The same here, again, Paolo in 2015, my first PhD student, and Rossana. There is a huge gain you can get if you design the way you process the information because you know in advance you are putting this intelligence in a mobile phone or in a watch or in a wearable device or in a device which is supposed to go in a harsh setting, low income settings now, because the way they need to work is different. Uh, just to give you an idea of what are we doing exactly now in this area, we are applying artificial intelligence. I'm sorry, this device is not working perfectly in cancer therapy. So nowadays we plan the therapy, we administer the therapy, and we measure the outcome. Now, if we can put some sensing over there, what we can do is to measure the reaction of the patient. In this case, is uh, alteration of sleep, circadian cycles. And we know that circadian cycle alterations, they are significantly associated with the outcome, with patient response to the therapy. Because if we can model this, then we can close this loop, and then we can start adding here a controller. So now we give a therapy, we sense the information through wearable sensors, and we use our artificial intelligence model in order to adapt the therapy towards the, uh, uh, the reaction of the patient dynamically. That's the last thing that we are doing. Again, Rosanna, she's leading this project in my lab. And how we are doing that? Well, we measure basically two hormones. Uh, cor uh, cortisol and melatonin, which they behave like that over the day. Cortisol is uh, having a plateau over lunchtime and then is getting down. Melatonin is doing the other way around. But normally they get measured through hormones, uh, tested through blood, salivary, and urinary sample, which are not practical. You don't use those things in, in every day in real life. Sorry about this. This machine is really broken. But we are using those devices. So we are doing 
proxy for those hormones through wearables. And the results are about in the next slides. Touch. And this is just to give you an idea of how well this is performing. But now, this is what we are doing in high income country. How can we translate this into the low income setting? This is just to tell you where we are coming from and how we are trying to plan this to make medical devices more performant and resilient to low income settings. Well, first thing we did was running eight field studies in two years, getting around Nigeria, Benin, Uganda, Ethiopia, South Africa. And uh, what we realized by doing this, we realized that we know a lot about how medical devices interact with people, whatever it means, patient, medical doctor, nurses. What we don't know is actually how medical devices interact with the environment in which they are used. And that's really, in my opinion, the challenge if we want to make medical devices more resilient, safe, effective in lower income settings. And I will tell you why. Now, if I was from America, I would have said, please, don't think in silos. But I'm from Italy, we are in Italy. I like to say we need to overcome the Cartesian model of knowledge. We have to stop thinking of our specialists, and we need to bring on the same table different competencies from different backgrounds. And we are now focusing on all these life cycle chain of medical devices. Design, please, if you have time tomorrow, have a look to Davide Piaggio presentation. Regulation, Alessia will present you what we are doing to prove that European regulations are not universal. We think they are, they are not. They were made to refrain the invasion of, uh, uh, you know, medical devices coming from abroad and protect our market. That's all. But now they are creating standard de facto. And those standards are killing people in low income settings. Because you design, a, I don't know, an oxygen concentrator thinking that you will have poor air in the Sargic Theater, 99.9%. So your device is expecting this air. If you enter a, a, a Sargic Theater in, in Africa, well, not all, but many of those, especially in the rural countries, they do not have any air filtering. And so now this device, which our manufacturer is suggesting to change the filter after, I don't know, 2,000 hours of working, they should be changed after 10 hours. Or the truth is that they should not be designed like that. So it's not just a maintenance problem, it's a design problem. We are putting their things that we think they work because we live in those fancy hospitals, but they don't. And the reason is that the market is 95% USA, America, uh, Europe, and Japan. So why a designer should think about Africa? That's less than 7% of the global market. So our mindset is towards the majority of the market, and still the wide majority of global population is traded in low income setting. So we have to face this problem and understand that our regulation is not ethical, is not universal. And Alessia, she's doing now a Marie Curie after having done a PhD working on that. So if you have time, have a look tomorrow, 4 p.m., Alessia will give this talk. Obviously management, I suggest you to see the presentation that uh, in, I don't see them here, Roland and Professor Medinu. Uh, we are doing together to create uh, CMMS for managing medical devices in three public hospitals in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Benin. And then I will say a few things about what we are doing in the assessment of medical devices tomorrow. Now, what do I mean by understanding the need? Well, we went around those different places, as I mentioned before. We started analyzing the real situation of hospitals in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, if you see like something like that, you understand this plant is not what you are expecting. And then you do some measure, sorry, this is not technically correct, but this was the best we could have done, measuring the voltage on the ground. How much it should be? Less than six volts. Here we were measuring hundreds of volts on the ground. And in this particular case, it was just because of this plug. This plug was not that ground, so this device was not hearted. And we are here in a surgical theater. You know what I mean? You know how many people could have died because of that. Now, what is this? Lack of knowledge, poor design, poor maintenance, it's all of that. You cannot just focus on one of those aspects. You have to understand this is part of a wider problem. This is X-ray unit. It was the best place to make a phone call. You see? Fulfilled. This means it was not shielded. It means that every time you were taking an image, the guy sitting behind this wall was getting the same amount of radiation, minus one over R squared, because it's distance. But the first thing we did is move this guy from here, put there a magazine, and don't say, shield the wall, because you don't have the money. But at least put there just a magazine. Probably not food, but certainly not people, because this is ionizing. So that's the level of problems we were facing. And now, most recently, Davide with Licha, they are, you know, this is them in Uganda last week, uh, using our fancy 
technology really to produce evidence on the state of the art of medical devices. Are they safe? Are they compliant with our standard? Are they broken? Is the oxygen coming out at the rate we should expect from? And the idea is that when you think about medical devices in our countries, you have in mind your international standard. Air filtered at 99.9% .9 in a surgical theater, on which you add probably legally, if you are in Southern Europe, or with state-of-the-art recommendation if you are in the northern part of Europe, minimum requirements. They are mandatory or not, depending from the country, legal system. And minimum requirements means they define clearly what the structure should look like, the technology which you should have in place in order to perform these analysis or these tests, and the organization, which means this number of nurses, this number of this kind of doctors. So whatever you know about the medical device is probably Posed on those pillars, which assume law, which assume international standard respect. Now, what is happening if suddenly you cannot rely on those international standards? You enter subject here that you don't have inverse pressure. What, what will happen? And then those minimum requirements, you don't even have regulation to enforce the any minimum requirement, which means you don't have any more disorganization. We heard before one medical physicist in the whole country. Uh, you didn't have the structural layout to open a surgical theater, and you're doing surgery in a place which would be closed before even open in Europe, and you don't have the underlying technology. It means that whatever you know in terms of effectiveness and safety of a medical device is now anymore, is not more true. You cannot rely on that. But the problem is that we don't have evidence. So what we started doing, we started to think, well, but can we make those devices resilient by design? So we started from this very small, simple device. This is an intrauterine balloon tamponade. Medical device saving a lot of life because you know, after a tragic event, the only thing you can do is to put pressure and try to stop bleeding. Within the uterus, after past partum, what we use in Europe is an intrauterine balloon tamponade. So we inflate the balloon within the uterus. We produce it with the master student and then David took over. A second that plastic, 3D printing, a condom, you have as many condoms as you need in Africa because of the campaign for prevention of disease. And we prove that we are now in the preclinical testing of the device, that such a facility, you can produce it yourself with uh, less than one euro, is a second that plastic. The, the 3D printing machine will melt the plastic at three or 500 degrees, so it gets out, which is pure. You open the condom, it's sterilized, you can use it. So that's something that you can do with less than one euro, I don't want to say in all the hospitals in Africa, but at least in the province. And then, because one of the problems we faced was the, is the poor supply chain. So you have fancy device, you don't use them because you don't have spare parts, you don't have consumables. So make it local, use uh, uh, you know, circular economy principles to make it local. This is what David will talk about tomorrow. We then became a bit more ambitious. We start from this project, this was published by a doctor from Palestine, making a 3D printed uh, uh, stethoscope. And then David told, well, can we bring this information within a mobile phone? Because if you can do, then with artificial intelligence, you can improve the quality of the signal, it's poor microphone, but with artificial intelligence, we can do much more than that, and probably support the diagnosis, because the other, lack of pro the other problem is the lack of specialized medical doctors. And this is what David specifically will present tomorrow. The same, uh, trying to design a, a, a device to look into the iridae, how it reacts to light, and tell you if there is a brain drama. Trauma. So once again, a mobile phone, a lot of artificial intelligence here, we have to work a lot, but we are getting very good results. Comparable, if not even better, you will see Davide presenting this, I don't remember if later today or tomorrow, Piaggio, you can look into the program, because this device is working now better than the benchmark, which was a commercial. Now, I don't have much time. What I want to say is that the problem we have here is to find a novel way to produce evidence-based information, both when we want to work in low mid sorry, this thing is a nightmare. If you want to work in uh, low-income countries or if you want to work with artificial intelligence in healthcare, so there is a huge problem. Where are we fitting this evidence? If you don't learn, if we don't learn how to produce uh, evidence-based information, both for clinical engineering and artificial intelligence, you will fail to introduce those things in medicine, because that's the way forward. And uh, my last slide, basically, we believe it is possible to make more resilient and safe medical device by design, changing the device of the design, keeping in mind is not bringing our device there, because this will kill people, and it's our responsibility.
starting to do. So have a look to the things that my guys are presenting. Thank you.